We're going to be talking about some things, though, that she mentioned in her comments. We're going to be talking a little bit about Summer of Blessing. I introduced that about two weeks ago. We're going to take some time here uh, just to sort of tie a bow over some things that we've been talking about the last seven or eight weeks. So let's kind of be, uh, uh, let's just all be together as we sort of sit back and sort of take all of that in so we get a flavor about what we are about throughout this, uh, this whole summer. And as we do that, I'm going to tell you a little story uh, to kind of of help shape how I want you to be thinking as we get into this this morning. This is a story by a fellow named J. Allen Peterson. Probably you've never heard of Alan, uh, which is okay, unless you're into marriage and family therapy and counseling. He is a therapist in that area. He's done a lot of writing in that field, uh, done a lot of speaking the world over, actually. But the most compelling thing that I think he ever wrote that I've read uh, it was something that happened to him on a flight. He was in the belly of a big, huge 747 flying from Brazil back home. And something happened on that flight. It was in the middle of the night. He was sound asleep, curled up in his little chair. How many people can sleep on a plane? Can you sleep on a plane? Uh, actually, it may sound odd. That's one of my best sleeping places is on an airplane. It really is. So Alan, was, he was just sound asleep on this uh, jet airplane. They're going back. When he heard something over the intercom that made him sit bolt upright in his seat. Here's what the voice said. This is your captain speaking. We are facing a very serious emergency. And somehow that cut through all the layers of his slumber. And I mean, he was wide awake. He, sa- he just heard that. I- he just sat right up and he heard that. And the voice went on to explain that they had gotten a hold of some contaminated fuel. And three of that plane's four engines were already gone, dead. They were out. And the fourth one could go out at any moment. At about the time he said that, the plane banked in the air and dropped a few hundred feet. And so you can imagine the mood almost pandemonium that was going on inside that inside that 747. They were going to attempt an emergency landing at an airstrip in the middle of the night, an airstrip not equipped for jumbo jets, uh, not equipped really for a plane coming in with only one of its engines. Now, you can land all right, but if you've got a short runway, there's all kinds of possibilities. So they were in trouble. They were in big trouble. plane was coming down. It had to come down. And he said while all that was happening, as the pilot said that, he said it was a very surreal uh, thing to him. Uh, And I don't know exactly what he means by that, but I've had moments that I feel like are surreal to me where it's like, you know, is this really happening? Is this really happening? Have you ever had a moment like that? Where you time, I I remember once before I was married, I was in a car accident, not a fender bender, but an accident where the car flipped over. and, and, And as that was, and it all happened just you know, that fast it was done. But somehow in the middle of all of that, as I'm kind of going over and over, it's like time slowed down. Is this what it's really like? Surreal moment. You ever had one of those? That's what he was experiencing. Is this really, really happening to me? Well, he was brought back to reality when the flight attendant said, prepare for impact. Now, folks, there's two things you never want to hear on a 747 flying in the middle of the night over South America. First one is, this is your captain speaking. We have a very serious emergency. And here's the second one, prepare for impact. You don't want to hear that. And so he immediately, when he heard that, went into kind of a fetal position. He put his head in his lap, drew his legs up underneath him. And as he was going down, he looked around and he saw uh, that everybody on that plane was doing exactly what he was doing. They were praying which supports my notion that in a 747 falling out of the sky in the middle of the night over South America, everybody's a believer. Do you believe that? Serious moment, a defining moment. So here they go, and he starts to pray. And here's what he prays. He prays, oh, God, thank you for the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ. And God, it has been a wonderful life. And as that plane continues to go, is that what you would have prayed? I don't know. As the plane was going down, right before impact, he says he cried out. In spite of himself, he wasn't really planning on it, but he just couldn't help it. He cried out, oh, God, my wife, my children. And boom. Now, you know how I know what he thought about and what he prayed about right before impact? Obviously, it's because he's one of the ones that survived the crash. Not everybody did. He survived it. Not only did he just survive it, miraculously almost, he was relatively unscathed through all of that, beat up. 
beat up, but they kind of did him once over, and so he's kind of free to walk about. Here's the thing that he noticed as he walked through that little airport, it had actually turned into a makeshift emergency uh, kind of thing, and there were triage things all over the place. He said every bone, every nerve, every muscle, every hair follicle was screaming out in pain. He said, I was in tremendous pain as all of this was happening. And he said, Here, here's the, the fascinating thing. He says, I could not speak. It was the trauma of it. You know, trauma does different things to you. And he said, I absolutely could not speak. My mouth would not work. It just would not open. But he said, my mind was racing like crazy. And he said, here's what I began to obsess about. I tried to figure out what had I been thinking as that plane was going down? Because it's kind of a defining moment. I mean, God forbid it should happen, but, but, but you would probably be thinking about those things that really defined who you are as a person, wouldn't you? You would really be focusing in on those really, really important things. So he tried to, he tried to reconstruct in his brain what he said and what he prayed about. And as he did, he realized, he remembered that he prayed, thank you to God and thank you for Jesus. And and he cried out for his, for his wife, and he cried out for his children, and then he put it all together. What really, he said, here's what it amounted to, what really defined my life, and what's really important to me is re- relationships. Does that surprise anybody in here? That doesn't surprise, that surprise me at all. I, I, if it, God forbid it should happen, but if you were in that kind of situation, would you be worrying about whether or not you unplugged the iron? Would you? Or would you be praying, God, I wish I'd had more time at the office. Would you be? No. It'd be those things that are nearest and dearest to you, those, those relationships. Now, two of those relationships one is with God and Jesus. So let's take that and kind of set that over here aside and, and assume that that's where we all are in that regard. The second kind of relationship that he talked about was those relationships with family, and those are special to us. We spent the last several weeks, twice, we've kind of talked about that. One was on Mother's Day when we talked about the divine impulse inside of a mother. Really, it's inside, every, inside everyone in a family relationship, that divine impulse that's a reflection of, uh, of God. Something happens to us when you get into family. It's hard to explain. I, I think we're seeing uh, that that. God of love, the God that created us, just as true and just as real as anything can be. If you're standing and looking through a telescope and you're seeing asteroids and and planets and galaxies moving away from us at speeds too fast to calculate, what you're seeing is the result of the divine thump, you know, that brought it all into existence. It's all still happening. That's what happens when you look into a mother or into family relationships. We see the image of him into whose, we see him into whose image we've been created, right? Right, yeah. Those are special relationships. We did it again last week when we had we had uh, the uh, celebration of new life and the and the senior tea. We celebrated our kids and and all of our role and all of that. Those are those family kinds of relationships. So we had that. But you know what? There are two kinds of relationships that Jesus and the Bible talks about even more than that that define us as believers. One is the relationship that we have with each other. Right? That relationship we have, it's old school language, but isn't it right? The relationship we have is brothers and sisters in Jesus. There's something special about that. The Bible uses that term, brothers and sisters. It describes that relationship that we have with each other as family. And that really communicates to us. We really, we can get a hold of that. Listen, at first service, uh, a lot of you know Leonard Barris. Leonard's been out for a number of weeks. It turns out he has blood clots all in his lung, and it comes from pieces, they think, of some cancer that attached to his kidney. He's had a kidney removed. It was He's just eaten up with cancer there, and all in his lungs. He can still hardly breathe. He was here at first service this morning. And and he said, can I say a word? And I said, you bet you can. I said, you bet you can. So during the welcome, I took him the microphone, and he could barely speak because he didn't have the wind. But I want to tell you what, he could barely speak because he was so overcome with the sense of emotion about the way his family, his family has stood beside him. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Is there anything in the world like that? Nothing is special as that. And, and you know what we did? We just erupted in applause for him and we just embraced him because of what God is doing in his life and his being able to say the things that he said to all of us. We're family here, man. That's great, isn't it? Now, here's the other relationship that God says a whole lot about and we don't often pay a lot of attention to it. Y'all ready? It's the relationship that we've been talking about for the last eight weeks. But it's the relationship that we have as believers with the world around us. 
the Gospel of John, the Apostle John uses that word world a lot. You know what he uses it to describe? He uses it to describe everything that's not from God. That's what he means by world or worldliness. Paul uses that term a lot as well. Everything that doesn't, represent, everything that doesn't come from God, everything that doesn't represent God. And we got a relationship. We're here in this world. Nobody goes to heaven from the baptistry, right? We're here for a reason. That's what we've been talking about. See, what we are spending our year on, let me just review just a little bit. For some of you, you're going to say, man, are you going to review that? Okay. <laughs> Again, yeah, I am. You know why? Because I really want us to get this. Because it's the essence of who we are and what we're about, right? We've been spending the year talking about cultivating the joy of generosity. We used to have a thing hanging right down here in the middle, but the ark is covering it all up, right? Celebrating the joy of generosity. And we started off this year talking about the nature of God, that God is generous. And as disciples, if we're really going to be imitators of him, we're going to be generous people. And then we talked about financial generosity. We spent several weeks about that. Kind of came up with a plan to help us become more generous. Not because uh, of so much of what we might need, and we do need a lot of things, right? But because of what generosity does with us as God shapes us. Now, for the last eight weeks, and by the way, we spent more time on this than we did on the first two parts of it combined. We've been talking about sharing our time and sharing our faith, being generous with our time and with our faith in acts of service, but especially in outreach and touching this world around us. And we spent some time laying down what we call a theology of outreach, all right? We looked at pretty seriously, just hang with me here just for a second, we looked pretty seriously at about 12 passages that kind of come up with it. We could have looked at another 12, all right? But there are four of them that are really important. I reviewed those three weeks ago, but I'm going to do it again, all right? You know why? Because I think if we don't get this, we need to have a good excuse. So let's get this, all right? Four passages that nail it down about who we are. First one is, whether you were here for the review or not, here's the first passage, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And a lot of you will recognize that as the great... Commission, yeah. Where Je last thing Jesus says to his disciples anywhere, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, according to the Gospel of Matthew, last thing he says, he says, all authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. And we know that, right? Because they're looking at a guy that was dead, came back to life. You better believe he's got the authority. You better believe it. He said, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into all the world and teach the Gospel, right? Here's what he says basically in that passage. Teach, baptize, and teach. I want you to duplicate yourselves. Recreate inside the lives of other people who you are and what you have. Not that we birth those people. It's God that does it. But we're the channel. We're the avenue. And here's a really significant piece about Matthew 28. Here's what we're all about, y'all. We're about a message. We're about a message. A message that Jesus Christ saves. A message that says we're folks that are lost in sin. That's our, that's our issue. That's the real problem in life. But Jesus Christ has come to set us free. And until the message gets communicated, something's missing, right? It doesn't matter how many people we feed. It doesn't matter how many good deeds we do, what all ministries we're involved in. If somehow or another, it doesn't get down to the business of that message getting shared. All we've done is rearrange deck chairs on the Titanic because the ship is going down. And it's the message that saves. Somebody say amen. I'm feeling kind of naked up here, right? I know it's kind of review, but you know what? That's, boy, that's the passage that informs us. It informs everything that we do. Now, here's the next two passages in Really, it's a repeat. Jesus says the same thing in both passages. If you're here three weeks ago, you already know what I'm going to say. He says it the first time in John 17 and verse 18. Then he says it again in John chapter 20 and verse 21. He says it both times about, give or take, 40 days before he said what he said in Matthew 28. He says it the first time to his apostles on a Thursday night. Three days go by and he says it again on a Sunday night. And you know what that statement bookends? It bookends the most significant event in human history, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what? If Jesus says something one time, that's going to get my attention. How about you? He says it twice. Right there around the event that defines who we are. I realize something's going on here, right? He said, here's what he said. Just as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. Now, what does that mean? It means, y'all, that we are nothing less than the incarnated body of Jesus Christ. That's exactly who we are. We're not just some doing some little, little silly something here, coming to church once or twice a week. Listen, our identity is at the heart of all of this. We are the incarnated body of Jesus, the hands and the feet of Jesus. And as God sent him into the world, he sends us. You know what? Our God is a missionary God. 
I know he's all powerful. He's measured the universe inch by inch. He holds the oceans in the palm of his hand, Isaiah chapter 40. There's nothing like him. That, that tells me God is big and God is huge and God is powerful. But let me tell you what he's a big, huge, powerful God, what that God's all about. It's about being a missionary. He's a missionary, servant. He sent Jesus into this world. He sent his spirit into this world. He sends you and me into this world, empowered by that spirit. Wow, guess what? We're all sent. Unless we get that notion somewhere along the way, we're missing something. Would you agree with that? We are a sent people. And we're not sent here to just proclaim a message. You know what? You know what my mission? My mission is not to make sure everybody's theology is exactly right. That is not my mission. I'm not telling you theology is not important. I'm not going to tell you that it's not critical. Sure it is. We want good theology. Jesus taught theology by what he did and by what he said. Sure he did. But that's not, listen, that's not my mission. Make sure everybody's got it right. Make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. My mission is to share Jesus. My mission is to be Jesus for this world. Not hurl truth bombs at them, hiding from behind a pulpit or hiding inside of a building or whatever. I've been sent like Jesus has been sent. How is he sent? Out there amongst them, y'all. Come on. We're not going to do it in here. You know what we are in here? We're getting empowered and we're being strengthened and we're being encouraged to get ready for what he's really called us to be and to do. Be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Hey, am I telling you the truth? Anybody want to argue with that? That's exactly what we're all about. See? We're not looking for some new gimmick to somehow get the message out. There is no new gimmick. The world has changed, Frodo, right? It's not the same anymore. We used to live in a world in a country that kind of supported us. It kind of propped up church because it held generally the same values that we hold as Christians. It ain't so anymore, and it's not ever going to be again, not at least in our lifetime in this culture. Not going to happen. We don't have that to rely on, y'all. And so maybe it's time that we get down to business just like they did in the first century and realize we are a sent people. Let me tell you about a guy named John Holm. <laughs> he's a preacher that lives over in England. And maybe he's up by now. First service, I know he was still asleep because of the time difference. He may be up now getting ready for his sermon or whatever. But he got, had some trouble with the law here uh, a few weeks ago. He, um, he, he had this idea that he'd get a paraglider and put a little motor on it. And he would get up on a foggy morning when you can't really see up. Because it gets foggy in England, Right? Doesn't it get foggy in England? Yeah, it gets foggy in England. Sure does. We have some guests here from England this morning. That's why I'm asking them. Yeah, it gets foggy. So his idea was is that he'd get on that paraglider and he would kind of go through there and people would hear this voice and they, maybe they would think he said that it was the voice of God. Y'all. What happened was he got a little crosswind going and almost crashed into some houses. Did not hurt any property. Nobody was hurt. But they fined him the equivalent of 1700 American dollars for causing a dangerous situation. They should have fined him for being stupid, shouldn't they? Is that going to make people... Listen, y'all, there's no magic bullet. There's no something else coming down the pipe. Here's what we're called to be. We're called to be sent as he was sent. A God who embraced... The idolatries and the dysfunctions and the brokenness and the sin and the pain and the shame and the suffering of the people around him. He took his identity on as his destiny. That's what we're about. Somebody say amen. I'm feeling kind of, yeah, that wasn't very hearty. Amen. amen. Now, how do you maintain, how do you maintain mm, incarnational ministry? Only one thing will do it, and that's divine love. And that's where that fourth passage comes in, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 21. Y'all remember what that says. Even if you hadn't been here for, if you weren't familiar with it, you know, we've talked about it for the last several weeks, but here's what it's about. Paul starts talking about something that he never got over. He never got over it. He never got over it that God became a human being and died for him. He never got past that. It absolutely blew his mind away. And he said, here's the deal, that one man died for the many. He just couldn't believe it. And he said, you know what? If that gets a hold of you, I'm giving you Mark's revised translation of that passage. He says, but if that gets a hold of you, you know what will happen? Then you'll die for him. One died for the many, so the many die for him. And it changes everything about you. It changes the way you look at life.
It changes the way you look at people. He goes on to say in verse 16, nobody looks the same anymore. Nobody looks the same anymore. Nobody is the same anymore. He says anybody that comes to Jesus is a new creature. And you don't even look at yourself the same way anymore. He says, you know what we are? We are ambassadors. Sent as he was sent. We are ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And we got a message. Always the message is there, y'all. What's the message in 2 Corinthians 5? Jesus Christ became sin for us. Jesus Christ became sin for us. That sounds harsh, doesn't it? I've heard folks get into debate about can Jesus really become sin? Yes, he did. He did. He did become sin. And that's why I'm standing here free today. That's why you're standing here redeemed today because Jesus Christ became sin. There's the message. That's the message that saves. Huh? Now, what are we going to do with that? Well, that's where summer blessing comes in, y'all. All kinds of things we might do, but that's where summer blessing comes in. You got a summer assignment. Homework this summer, y'all. You know what? Last week, I, I, I mentioned school's out for summer. Y'all, if y'all were here in second service, there's enough baby boomers in second service that I think you guys would have started singing that song if I'd have given you about half a chance. Alice Cooper is the guy that wrote that. Came out with that song back in 1972. It was his fifth album. Is there anybody in here that's never heard that song? Everybody here cool? Everybody heard that song? Yeah, there were some people in first service that said they had never heard that song. I always knew second service was cooler than first. I always knew that. Yeah, yeah. Listen, yesterday I take my granddaughter to go get donut holes, uh, you know, at a place down the road. I'm driving. You know what she's doing in the back seat? She's singing. You know what she's singing? School's out for summer. School's out forever. That's the biggest song that Alice Cooper ever did. Now, you know why he wrote that song? You're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? Well, I'm getting to that. Hold on. <laughs> he wrote that in response to a question that an interviewer asked him. What are the three greatest moments in your life? What are the most three most significant minutes in your life? And they asked him that question. He said, you know what? There's two events every year. One of them is Christmas. And he said, Christmas morning when you're all there and you got all these presents and you're waiting for it to start. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're way, I mean, man, the anticipation, he said, he said, wow, he said, that's pretty, def pretty defining, and he said, the second event is the last three minutes of the last day of school before the last bell rings, he said, it's like a slow burning fire, you're looking at that clock, and you just can't wait, he said, and then it dawned on me, if you could ever capture that in a song, it'd be big. <laughs> You know what this year is? It's the 40th anniversary of that song. And everybody in here knows that my little granddaughter, six years old, sings that song. I don't know that they really anticipated that, but that's it's probably the biggest song that they had. Now, here's why I'm telling you that. They're looking back at it 40 years later and saying, man, that's a, maybe the greatest song that we ever did. Now, all the verses don't make sense, y'all. If you look at it, it doesn't make sense. But then look at Alice Cooper. He doesn't make sense. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just to look at it, it just doesn't make sense. But 40 years later... Rolling Stone magazine calls that song one of the 500 greatest songs ever written. VH1 back in 2009 said it's the 35th greatest rock, hard rock song ever recorded. I don't think they knew that at the time, but 40 years later, they look back on that and say, look at that. Here's what I'm, here's what I'm getting at. Summer blessing is not just some silly little something. I want us, I hope... X number of years from now, we look back at the summer of 2012, and we say, that's it. That's the summer when what being missional really began to click with me. That's when it really began to click with this church. We've been talking about being missional for seven or eight years, y'all. Now we're talking about really getting out. Here's the deal. We're talking about everybody having two churches. That's what I mentioned to you two weeks ago. This is my church, and my cul-de-sac is my church. 14 houses. I've lived there 25 years. Don't know half the people. What's wrong with that? Everything. Everything. Maybe it's your neighborhood. Maybe it's your work. Maybe, as Kathy said, you go to Starbucks. Anybody here go to Starbucks every day? Is that what she said, go to Starbucks every day? Get out of here, town here. But anyway, maybe it's a restaurant. But it's people that you know. Our assignment last week, we're getting an assignment every week. Our assignment last week was just to pray. Incredible things happen when you pray for people. I've started doing that. I mean, started going up and down my cul-de-sac praying about the people in, that, in those houses. Did you know that there are three new families moving in? After all these years, three new families are moving into my, in my neighborhood. Is that an accident? I don't think it is. And you know what? It's kind of hard to tell. Right now, our assignment this week is to write a note, right? And, 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 and that's good. But it, it seems to me God's maybe put me on hyperdrive because there's, there's more going on in that. 
I can't hardly wait for the note. We've kind of, we've kind of, and some of you have as well, because you've told me some stuff. Twice this summer, we're going to get together on Wednesday nights for a little potluck, and we're going to talk about what God has been doing through this whole day. Well, those people that you really thought were attached at the hip with a lawnmower, didn't know they did anything except mow their lawn, you're going to be able to give some testimony about what God is doing. We're not going to be people that just sit in this room. We are not going to be people that just sit in this room. We're the missional people of God. Now, it requires something, okay? I'm going to say this quickly, and we're done. It requires something of you. Time, well, yeah, that's what we're talking about, being generous with our time and faith. Commitment, is that what, well, yeah. We're going to talk about commitment in a few weeks. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and that burning hot commitment, all right? Well, let me tell you what else it takes. It's going to require some changes in the way we look at stuff. It's going to require change in the way we look at church, you know, church is no longer the place where we get just the right set of programs and just the right set of attractive things. Everybody's going to come. No. North American church has by and large denied that fact. They said the world's going to wake up one day and this will all work again. Uh, 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 uh. I want to say it again. The world has changed, Frodo. Not ever that way. We're going to have to be exactly who God called us to be in the first place. The embodiment of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be in our world, and we're going to be in those. And you know what the purpose of all of that summer of blessing or whatever? It's not for you to go out and have 15 Bible studies. You know what it is? It's for you to be the hands and feet of Jesus. And as the Spirit leads, as the Spirit opens up opportunities, then you take advantage of that, whatever it might be. That's what it is. It's God's business. Amen? It's God's business. That's what it, So it requires a change in perception how we look at church. It requires a change in perception how we look at our fellowship. I had lunch with Bob Anderson the other day. Bob, where are you? you're right over here. The other day, and Bob made a statement. Actually, he wrote it to me in an email first, and I said, man, did you really mean that? He said, yeah, I did. Here's a statement that he made. He said, traditional churches of Christ are on life support. Anybody here need that interpreted? You know what? I agree with him. We, gotta, we got to see what God is calling us to see and what God is calling us to be. And wouldn't it be great if we really did get back to our restoration roots where we're not about the business of always talking about our brand? Let's just be God's people. Let's just be Christians and proclaim this message to the world. Jesus Christ died. Jesus Christ was resurrected. Jesus Christ is here so that we might have life. That's our message, y'all. It's going to change our perspective on worship. Worship, you betcha. We're talking about hiring a worship minister. We're not looking for somebody that can, that can pick out eight songs and pitch them right. Ah. And by the way, worship is not an exercise where God is testing us to see how well we're going to do it or if we're going to mess up or not. No. Quit thinking that. Worship is sustenance. Worship is engagement with God. It is connection with Him. It, reach, it results in an empowerment that makes us ready to go out and do what He calls us to do, be what he, what he calls us to be. 1 Corinthians 14 says it's about outreach and it's about edification. It's about an emotional connection. And folks, if we don't connect emotionally, I want to tell you what, we're probably just going to sit here. A worship minister is somebody who's going to help us get into the throne room of God. Help us to experience Him. That's what we're asking. We've got a job description that's about a mile long for this guy. We're looking for somebody that's going to do really, really what we think worship ought to be about. I'm going to tell you what else. It changes the way we look at ourselves. Look at this. I'm going to do this like really quick. Take 60 seconds. I'm going to give you eight words that describe who we are as the missional people of God based on that foundation that we laid. Here we are, number one, missionaries. I don't know if you can see that or not, but here it is. We're missionaries. Being, being who God calls us to be does not mean that we go to a church that has a missions program or we go to a church that has an evangelism program. It means that we are the missionaries. We are those missionaries. Do you know what's happened? Do you know what's happened? America is no longer where it used to be. Back in 1900, 80% of all the Christians in the world lived in the United States and in Europe. Today, 40% does. Let me tell you where it's hot right now. God's still moving in this world. Not so much here in the United States. What's wrong with that? What's up with that? Is it God lost his power? Let me tell you what. No, that's not it. Let me tell you what's going on. In Latin America, there are 480 million people that claim to be Christians. That's more than the entire population of the United States. 
And boom, 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 growing and going. Africa, 360 million, still larger than the entire population of the United States. Asia, 313 million, almost right at the, a little bit more than the population of the United States. What's going on at Sugar Grove? What's going on in Sugarland? What's going on in Siena Plantation? What's going on in your neck of the woods? Is it because God's lost his power? What's going on here, y'all? We are missionaries, all right? Here it is, second word, representative. We're a representative of Jesus Christ. As soon as you go out that door, you're representative of Jesus Christ, an ambassador for him. Here's the third term, not an address. We are, Christ, being a Christian doesn't mean that we go to church a couple of times a week. It means we are God's people, right? It's, an, it's not what we do. It's who we are. It's our essence. Joiners with him is the next phrase. We're not here to take Jesus to a co culture. Jesus is working in this world. Jesus is working in your neighborhood. Jesus is working right now in your neighborhood. Did you, realize, you know that? Our job is to go join him in what he's doing. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. We're looking to join him in what he does. Next one, nonconformist. We're in the world, but we're not of it. A little more we can say about that. But look at this next phrase, relationships and not targets. We are not looking at people as evangelistic targets. I hate to be targeted. Do you? As soon as I think a marketer has targeted me, my brakes go on, and here I am. We are not looking for evangelistic targets. We are looking to build relationships with people. We are the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And wherever God takes that, it's going to be by the leading of the Spirit, right? That's dependent. That's the next word, dependent. We're not looking to do things the way we've always done it or whatever else it might be. We're looking for the Spirit of God to lead us through prayer, through Bible study, through our interaction with each other, and destiny, folks. Their destiny is our destiny. By their, I'm talking about the folks in our neighborhoods and who we work with and all around us. Our destinies are the same. It ain't us and them. We're together. What do you think? Summer blessing, y'all. Can we serve you in any way this morning? Got any needs? Let us know about it as we sing our theme song of Summer Blessing. Let's stand together. Love one another for love.